Good evening, everybody here in the room, and also a warm welcome to our audience on the live stream and webcast. Um, this is the press conference with Will I Am. Um, we are very pleased to have him here, and uh, on behalf of the World Economic Forum, we are very honored that he joins us uh, today. He's coming straight from his session, and uh, he will share some of his insights, but uh, um, maybe looking at the time, we go straight to the questions, uh, if that's fine with you. Um, so if you could, for the sake also of our online audience, raise your hand, say your name and organization, and uh, there's a microphone in the room, please. Can I see a show of hands? Host. Horst von Butler, Capital Magazine. Um, disruption is one of the main topics here in Davos, and you come uh, from an uh, industry that was disrupted first. What is your key business lesson for other leaders? Thank you. Maybe we take the second question also. Oh, um, can I don't want to forget how I'm going to answer okay. that, though. Well, have at it. So uh, our industry got hit by something that we probably never thought would transform our industry. Um, and the idea of making music is still a beautiful thing, and music has never been this robust as far as the listening and the creation of music. The business of it has altered forever because I feel we forgot what we were. The music industry was always hardware. Right? RCA was gramophones and NTSC and television, and the art was a, was a component to the hardware. And so my advice to business leaders is to really consider that your place tomorrow is not guaranteed. So we saw the same thing happen to the music industry, happen to film. Kodak was the dominant force in capturing images. Now it's Instagram. So in theory, and if they, uh, in theory, Kodak should have created Instagram, but they were so baked into making money the way they always did uh, that they, they, they can't disrupt themselves. So, um, and, and there's other businesses that I feel do a very good job thinking forward and mining the business that they have now, and that's companies like Apple. Um, companies like Apple. <laughs> I don't know any other company like those guys. They're, they're an amazing company. Good evening, Rula Tarano from CNBC, Arabia TV. Um, I believe that you take Davos as a, a, a good opportunity to, uh, to give your uh, point of view, and especially about the smart learning. Um, what the segment of uh, kids, if, you, if we can say, or the student, you are looking for? So um, I, wa I wanted to come to Davos to give my perspective on what's happening in the world between private sector, um, especially in America, the private sector, there's a private sector for prisons and not a private sector for education. Um, so when you have uh, technology growing more robust, more powerful, smarter, faster, um, you can't say the same thing is happening for uh, education in America and around the world. And there's an imbalance uh, between opportunities in inner cities around uh, computer science, engineering, technology, mathematics, um, and prisons. It, it just hurts my heart and my soul that there's a such thing as a private investment angle in prisons in America and no education. So it, it's a human rights issue um, so I, I come here to, you know, to raise that flag on something that we should be concerned about, seeing that there's a lack of engineers, seeing that there's companies that uh, in America that can't hire Americans because we're not educated in com computer science and engineering. And we also have, uh, uh, at the same time, um, uh, immigration weirdness where most of the companies, even mine, the one that I started, a lot of my employees are from Bangalore, India, and I want to bring them to America and can't. It's not easy to do that. So, you know, um, to bring in those things up with the work that I'm doing in my inner city, uh, teaching kids how to build robots and write uh, code um, to balance it off. 
right? So I don't want to complain. So I, I want to also help and provide solutions. And, um, and and the outcome from the work that we're doing there has been great. Our kids went from having 1.2s to 4.0s. Some of our kids are going to graduate next year and go to MIT and uh, UCI and hopefully Stanford. Um, so we've had some success. Thank you. Can I have a show of hands for more questions? I have a question. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, well, There's this. a gentleman in the back. Uh, forgive me. I, uh, I actually work for the World Academic Forum. Um, Will, you've, um, I'm sure the participants have learned a lot from you uh, being here at Davos. Have, they, have you learned anything? Are you going to take anything away yourself for being here this week? Yeah. Um, someone asked me a, a question in an interview yesterday, and uh, I wasn't expecting the question because usually, and I really appreciate awesome questions in interviews. Guy says, uh, so you're here in the mountains at Davos with the 1%. You wouldn't consider yourself a 1%, would you? Um, how do you feel about um, the 1% versus the 99%. Um, and it, I never really looked at myself as a 1% because my whole life I was poor. And then I realized that there's a guy by the name of Naveen Jain from India who was poorer than me. And Naveen Jain's really successful now in life. Um, and what it showed me was that I need to go back and tell the kids in the neighborhoods like mine that what they tell you on the news about the 1% versus the 99%, it's not like there's a, a wall saying that you can't be a part of it. Right? There's skill sets out there for you to learn. It's all online. The information is there for you. You can change your life. You can, If you surround yourself with good people and discipline yourself in certain areas in life, you too can live a, a good life. Um, and I learned that and I saw that firsthand in my life and people like Naveen Jain, people like Mark Benioff, companies. And then there's some companies that don't give to, you know, they don't, they don't give a shit about anybody. And it's people like Naveen Jain and Salesforce that hopefully will inspire other companies to care. Um, and that's what I learned about being here is that there's a lot of companies that care. There's a lot of billionaires that care. And there's a lot of uh, opportunities out there for folks to go from here to there. Um, and I'm glad I came here um, this week. And I can't wait to come back next year. We're certainly happy to hear that. Uh, there's another question from the lady right there. Hi, I'm Yasmin Shahata from uh, Enigma magazine in Egypt. Um, uh, I'm sorry I came a bit late, so I don't know if this question would be repetitive. But uh, with your foundation, and now that you're an, such an iconic international personality, uh, are you looking also to inspire people around the world, especially uh, the Middle East, where a lot of people feel that if they're not born into wealth, that they'll never achieve it? It's still the, you know, it was one of the reasons why that. Arab Spring came about. So is that something that's interesting of interest to you, or are you focused more on the U.S. for now? Right now I'm focused on, thing, on, on areas that I know that I can tackle. Right? I'm just, just me and uh, the people that help. Um, I, I don't have a big organization. My foundation at the most, I think it's like five people, led by Tatiana who's not here, but the bandwidth is, we don't have a big bandwidth. Um, and the support will allow us to grow and scale. Um, but there's, there's, if there's things that I could align with, if there's charities and foundations in the Middle East to encourage and let people know firsthand my experience coming from poverty to being able to take care of my family um, and growing up, I never thought we would, you know, be wealthy. And I never, you never think that because everyone around you is poor. And then someone pours out uh, encouragement and opportunities. 
And I think that more of that needs to happen in places like the Middle East and the Philippines and uh, um, the Brazil and Uruguay and Paraguay. Um, so if I could lend myself to encourage folks and share, you know, my story and my best friend's story, Apple, um, I would love to do that. Thank you. One more question in the front. Thank you. Actually, I'm a mom of three kids. They are a big fan of you. Oh, thank so, you. There is a, a bigger problem that they are really uh, very touched with all the technology um, around us. So you think that you can create a song, not to play with their minds, as much as to teach them what to take the benefits from these kind of uh, uh, devices or what, etc., and and what to avoid it because it's not about to provide them with the equipment as much as to 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 take the benefits from these things. Um, you know, it is open. The internet is open. They can learn a lot of things behind their parents. So it is not your problem. I know that, but uh, you can mention it in uh, any of your uh, like um, songs, or you don't want to um, to mix it. You want to talk in your song about the cook, about the weed, it, it's your freedom. But on the other side, yeah, I, in the future, it's mean, not because you are mm, supporting the one of okay, the cases. Thank you. I it think means, yeah, it uh, means you are, not, you are not free to put whatever you want uh, in your song. As thank you. Case. Thank you for the question. I'm trying to understand the question. Um, yeah, <laughs> we're in the same boat here. So my... I could I could share how my family d does things around um, devices, and if your if your question is like how do you inspire kids to not use their devices as much, or I'm, I'm trying to it's just the, the good things from it. yeah. So the good things, it's just what you do as a family. So if you see if you see your kids always on your tablet and their phone, it's good thing. It's a good thing to do things together on your tablet on your phone. So in my family, we my mom will bring up, Willie, I was on the internet and I googled this one thing about, you know, um, um, what what one thing she was uh, last last during Christmas. Um, now my mom's into science, all right? She googles science stuff, and we all get together and look at those things. And we do it as a group. So the information is all there, but. Who, what, where's the filter? The filter comes from what you do as a group together and sharing information as much as you do, you know, funny things on the Internet. Right. So we have to also take time to look and search for things and have search what I call search parties. You would take your time and your as an individual to search amazing things to learn about. So then when you get with your group of friends, you all share the things you've learned with these devices. And it's it's a great exercise as as much as it is to, you know, get occupied by shallow stuff that we all share, seem to share around the Internet. How many times have you said, check this out, and it's all just shallow nothingness? So take the time to go deep into this ocean called the Internet and find gems of knowledge and nuggets and do that with your kids, right? So, you know, it's all there. You just got to, how you want, what do you want to put in their minds? There's uh, two more questions in the front here. If we could have the microphone. And please, if you could say your name and your organization. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Farah Boucherak. I work for Frost24. I just have a simple question. You said you, you were poor and you didn't believe that you, be you could become rich. What changed? Um, encouragement from uh, my friends and family. So um, I remember... Uh, Standing in line for free cheese and free milk. And I remember being embarrassed to go to school with a lunch ticket, a government lunch ticket. I know what that embarrassment felt like when everyone else had a lunch bag and money. I remember what it feels like to uh, to stand in the welfare line. I remember what it feels like when um, you, in my school, I went to a very rich school. There was one time where... And my classroom, we had to collect cans and, and food to give to the four poor people. And I remember that year, my mom didn't let me take canned food to school. And I remember the follow-up was, 
the school came to my house and gave us the food because we were the poor family. I remember what that felt like, how embarrassed we were because I never knew we were poor because everyone else around me was poor. So the trick, the funny little riddle about poverty, you never know you're poor until you go outside your community. And then when you go outside your community and people outside your community acknowledge the things that you're doing, whether it's art or you're the way you think, then you realize there's a way out of it because someone outside your community that's from a better community acknowledged the little gym that you had. And that's when I knew that I had a fighting chance to take care of my family. So if, the whole, if you encourage kids, whether you're poor or not, to be the provider and you give that kid responsibility, then nine times out of ten they're going to pull through. You got to encourage them. You got to make them accountable. You have to let them, tell them the truth about the world, the way it's configured, and point out the folks that are there to help. Because there's people there to help, right? There's tools there to help them. Uh, you just got to make them accountable. Someone made me accountable, and those are my teachers, Miss Montez, Mr. Wright. They encouraged me. Thank you. And the next question. My name's Gay Flashman. I'm from the forums web team. Um, you mentioned earlier Salesforce, Apple. They're big companies who've got deep pockets who are able to support kids and maybe have programs. What do you think smaller companies and, and businesses can practically do to help kids and support them and find education? So you know, money's money, and eventually money will evaporate. But mentoring's forever. And even if you're a smaller company and you got, you know, um, a, a tight budget, but amazing minds and skillful workers, just encouraging a kid, going out there, teaching them something. You know, that, that never evaporates. Skills never evaporate. Money will eventually evaporate. So it doesn't matter how much money you have, just how much heart do you have to go out and you know, give somebody a hand up or enable them and teach them how to plant and fish. Thank you. I see this at the moment, no more questions. Well, Will, I have to thank you. I mean, this has been really inspirational. I think it's great, and thank you for joining us. I think everybody in the room ag agrees that this is a voice and a message uh, we, we definitely need to hear in Davos, and uh, it's good that you've he been here, and you said you're looking forward to coming next year, and, and, yeah, and, and we do too. And thank, thank you, you, thank you so much for the folks at Davos, uh, Klaus Schwab, for inviting me um, and being open-minded to have me sit on panels and speak about what I'm doing. And the world of music in our world could be very helpful, um, and it takes an open mind to invite my world here. Um, you know, because I know sometimes my world could be a little scattered and dysfunctional and disruptive. But there's a lot of us that do good. Um, and thanks for that. And it's a great uh, collaboration. And I can't wait to come back next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.